Emmanuel Pondy. I'm a professor of international relations and uh, political science at the International Relations Institute of Cameroon, which is based in Yaoundé. I uh, bring you greetings from uh, the academic community from there. And I would like to uh, also say that uh, in my youth, that is to say last century, uh, I spent uh, quite a few years in uh, the then Zaire. Uh, so it means that it's under the presidency of President uh, Mobutu Sese Seko Kunkungwendu Wazabanga at the time. Since then, uh, of course, we've been following very closely what has happened or what is happening in the DRC. And um, today I thought it good to ponder and to wonder, to discuss on, in fact, what has happened as far as democratic process is concerned in that country. Uh, this evening I will exchange with you, of course, and but I will bring the topic in three phases. Number one, why is the DRC an important actor in international relations, not only for uh, Africa, but also in the international arena generally? Why? The second uh, question which I will attempt to ask is, of course, whether we are witnessing a new beginning after the presidential elections. And the third, of course, will be, if yes, why? If not, why not? Uh, I will end with uh, what I think is very important, is to put this all in context. That is to say, it brings back reflections on what democracy is all about. Uh, what is the impact of democracy? What is the, the role of democracy? What is the end result of democracy? And what do we mean by democracy? And then, secondly, uh, we'll discuss on a very important aspect, as far as I'm concerned. Can you change a country without changing its educational system? And to me, it is a central question, which today must be um, confronted by most African countries. It seems to me that the educational system, which is ours, is certainly problematic and is unlikely to produce the kind of results which we are looking for. It also produces increased immigration. It produces a lot of um, lack of comfort with who we are and what we want to be. So I will end up my discussion uh, with that. So without uh, any further ado, I would start with, uh, of course, uh, why is it quite legitimate to consider the DRC an important international actor not only in Africa, but around the world. Uh, it's good to know that way back uh, in history, of course, um, colonization, which is often referred to, started in a very bad manner there. Um, it's a very unique case where a private uh, uh, concession was in fact taken by somebody. In other cases, we didn't have private, the privatization of, concept, of, of the concession. But it's true that the Belgians uh, themselves, the Belgian state, uh, put an end to that by uh, taking that and now directing things by, by itself. So it's one example already of something which, which was a bit unique. But more recently, the Belgian Congo uh, was uh, involved in the East-West global competition in a very uh, unusual way. Because the bomb which was dropped in Hiroshima and Nagasaki had uranium coming from there. So you see that the, the Western countries looked everywhere, but located that particular place and used that, I think it was called Little Boy, uh, I think that was the name of, of the bomb, which I think is not a very appropriate cook when you see what, what was done. But I think it shows that it was part and, and willing and a direct actor of a major 
I think, uh, earthquake that happened then. Also, we should not forget that the Belgian Congo was the scene of the first peacemaking operations of the United Nations in Africa, 1960, 1964. So the question which you ask today, the blue helmets are still in the same country. I think it begs the question of, in fact, what is the balance sheet? And what is finally the logic behind these approaches? And I think the best place to ask that question is today, of course, the DRC. Also, in terms of its significance to world affairs, unfortunately, uh, Dag Amajord, the second United Nations Secretary General, as you know, uh, died while treating the Congo files um, between, uh, uh, I think it was between Zambia and, 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 uh, and the Congo, where his plane crashed. So he was, of course, a, 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 an important victim of that important problem. So if we only take these marks around the world, it shows that the Congo has an importance uh, to all of us as human beings. And there is, a, uh, there is an image that says that which, when you take Africa, uh, the place where the trigger, if you had a revolver, where the trigger is located is precisely in that area of the Congo. So it may be an image, but I think we should take it seriously because of the importance of a place, 84 million inhabitants today, with a GDP per capita of around $478 only, when compared to a huge country like uh, Nigeria with 195 million people, which has two th uh, a GDP per, per capita of over 2,000. Uh, it means that there is a problem of uh, repartition, a problem of, of, of uh, of uh, wealth distribution. So I wanted just to give uh, some reasons why I think it's important to, to really look seriously at that particular country as being a symbolic country for uh, what we want Africa to become uh, in the good sense, but also, uh, God forbid, if things uh, go wrongly, I think that the Congo has always been at the forefront of uh, African preoccupations and African uh, action. Now, concerning the uh, 19, uh, 2019 uh, process, democratic process in, in, in the DRC today, um, I think it's uh, good to know that uh, uh, elections, presidential elections, took place uh, at long last after two years of, uh, uh, I would say, procrastination or delays. Uh, and all kinds of, uh, of uh, reasons to, 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 to not to hold them, but finally they, they were held. And uh, at the end of, uh, of the session, the results were given. Uh, the results were, as we all know, as, I think, uh, as such. Uh, Felix Antoine Shisekedi, 38.5%. Um, Martin Fayolo, 34.8%. And then Emmanuel Ramazani Shadari, 23.8%. Um, of course, these gave rise to um, very differing uh, uh, interpretations, which were also um, a reason for preoccupation. Okay? But what can be said uh, right from the start is that uh, what happened in the Congo has historical uh, significance. Because since June 30th, 1960, which is the day of independence of Congo, I think that that country, unfortunately for us uh, Africans, has witnessed a very traumatic entry into independence. And I think that we must be very much aware of the trauma uh, that independence has caused in terms of the subsequent events 
uh, we had uh, secessions here and there in Katanga. Uh, we, we, we had a lot of, of uh, traumatic events. And I think more than anywhere in, 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 in the sub-Saharan Africa of the 1960s and 1970s, uh, the Congo was really an illustration of uh, the many problems that can be accumulated in one country. And that is why when today we are seeing a, a peaceful uh, transition uh, at the presidential level, I think that it is absolutely important. We cannot belittle it or we cannot say that it is, it is uh, something which is marginal. In fact, uh, as you know, there were uh, the, tr the first transition in uh, November 1965 occurred uh, between uh, Mr. Kasavubu and uh, uh, Colonel uh, uh, Joseph Desiré Mobutu uh, after a coup, of course, uh, 24th of uh, November 1965. And then the second one occurred uh, in uh, July 1997 uh, when uh, um, President Mobutu was ousted of, from power. So, uh, and after that, we had a, an assassination in January 2001 uh, when uh, President uh, Kabila, father, was, was killed and replaced by the son uh, in, in 2001. So these are three traumatic events which are not constitutionally recognized by any, any law, any legal process, certainly not by the OAU nor by the AU. So uh, that's why what has happened uh, is of significance. Uh, it can be appreciated uh, in many ways, but it cannot be denied that it is a trend which is a, uh, a good signal, at least for most of African countries. Now, having said that, of course, the question uh, becomes, uh, is this a new beginning? Uh, can we consider that uh, the personnel which uh, is there is um, uh, capable of actually changing things, of uh, bringing a new agenda, of um, uh, charting a new course of a for the country, and for renewing the political culture of the DRC. And I think that is where we can say, if the answer is positive, it is possible to say it is a new beginning. Unfortunately, um, of course, the head of state is new. It has never been uh, in politics, unlike his father, who's been there for at least 50 years, at least. Uh, the main opponent of, of President Mobutu uh, was him, even though in 1991, I think he was part of the, of the, of the government. But he, it is well known that he has been a stout and very clear uh, member and leader of the opposition of all the, uh, the time he's been, uh, he's been uh, in politics. So when you look at uh, the personnel today, you will find out that uh, it is a personnel which is known by most people who are around and who have observed. Uh, be it uh, Vital Camere, who was the chief of the campaign, uh, be it uh, Martin uh, Fayulu, who of course is also known, uh, be it Emmanuel Ramazani Shadari, who uh, was the flag bearer of uh, the outgoing president. So in fact, it's not a new crew, for sure. And the question is, can they bring a new philosophy, a new political culture, a new direction to the country? I always say that it is not good to have prejudices. I don't think that some, somebody should be condemned without having been seen uh, at work. I think that many people, in fact, approach the problem not through what they, they, they see or through what uh, kind of in, in indexes they have, but according to their own uh, previous prejudices. 
So I think that one thing which, which is worrying, of course, is that the Prime Minister was only named on the 20th of May, 19, uh, sorry, 2019, which is six months after the arrival to power. This is highly unusual. Now, will it mean that he's not master of his own, uh, as the, pre the president is not master of his own uh, decisions? We don't know. So what I would suggest is that we should give time to ourselves in order to bring in an appreciation. For now, appreciation is not based on observation. It is based on what we think will happen, what we think might happen on the basis of the past, not on the basis of the present. And I think that if you take in Africa uh, examples, there are many, many surprises. Take Egypt. Egypt with Anwar el-Sadat, when he came to power, I, I, I read so many things concerning him. But today, he has left a trace uh, in, in the Egyptian history, a deep trace. Uh, the, the, the agreements which he signed are still on today. And in fact, the one whom he, he, he changed, whose name is uh, Gamal Abdel Nasser, uh, has not left something which is uh, worthy of staying in terms of uh, international relations for the centuries to come. So I'm saying, what I'm saying is that we must stop, as Africans, to always use our prejudices to judge situations or people. Let give this, the current situation time to show what can be done. And maybe then we'll be able, we'll be in a better position to judge whether the actors have gone one way or the other. So that is the first thing that I want to say. The second thing, which is not always uh, looked into very well, is that today the DRC has started an economic, um, an, an economic embellishment, 3.8. Uh, was 2018 of uh, GDP growth rate. Today, what is projected for 2019 is 4.1. And what is very interesting, indeed, is that uh, the kind of products which the DRC has cannot be uh, substituted. Uh, when you take uh, the cell phones, when you take the batteries for, for cars, which is the new technology which is being put in place now, the DRC cannot be avoided. It has to be uh, taken on board. And today, the cobalt, for instance, uh, half of the cobalt reserves of the world are there. So it means, therefore, that the, 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 the bull years, the good years, uh, can be used positively for the population. And I think the new mining code, which came into being on the 13th of June, 2019, uh, is really something which could help, which could help, uh, provided that the, 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 the leadership is, uh, is strong enough to face the Canadian firms, the uh, uh, South African firms, uh, the Chinese firms, there are a bit four or five, which are the big, uh, the big ones there, and which are, of course, uh, uh, resisting the changes. When you have subventions to the state that go from 2% to 10%, I think it's very important, it's very important. Uh, and there are now special, uh, special uh, payments which are due for extra uh, special pr profits as well, up to 50%. So I think that these could help if the, 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 the personnel, the political personnel of, of uh, DRC is really serious about working for the people. And I think that is where the problem may be. We have many speeches. We have many pronouncements. We have, everybody says, I'm for the people, with the people, and of the people. But in fact, what has obtained for the last, I would say, 50 years or so, is that we've seen people who have cared much about their own pocket first. And this is not true only for DRC, unfortunately. It's true for many, many countries in Africa. And uh, therefore, uh, the situation we are facing today in the DRC 
is very much reminiscent in terms of the boom years of uh, cobalt, of, of copper, and all that, which we witnessed in the 1972-73, when the zionization process went on. So I think there is something to be, to be done. There is something to be said. OK, also, a question uh, is asked. Is it possible uh, when the president uh, doesn't have the majority, and then he's surrounded in parliament by the, the uh, majority, can he work? I would like to, to draw your attention to the fact that the very first republic was exactly in that same configuration. Um, Joseph Kosavubu did not have the majority politically. Uh, it was held by uh, um, Patrice Emery Lumumba. So it's not the first time that it happens. But unfortunately, we've seen also that it's led to catastrophic results uh, because uh, the, the, the world was, I mean, the, the, the country was in total, in total, uh, uh, total, uh, uh, I would say, action, not in a positive manner. Okay, so we can say that we need to see whether, given the opportunity to act, we can then draw the conclusion of it's a new beginning or not. But I think that the context is uh, historically unique. The context is historically uh, uh, appealing for good and serious politicians to do something. Now, if we go towards structural things, structural problems, we'll see that there can be no change as long as a few variables are not taken care of. The first variable I have in mind is, of course, the training of everybody, including the political personnel. There is no instance of an emerging country that has been emergent without having first changed its educational system. If you take China, they did it. Way back, the Japanese, during the Meiji era, era, 1868, they did that. They sent their best brains around the world to collect current knowledge and bring it back to, to Japan. When they got to Japan, what they did with that knowledge explains why 100 years later, Japan was classified the number three world economy in the world. So they, had, they were able to contextualize it. So the problem today, is how long will it take for African countries to understand that an educational system must be a reflection of the type of citizenship you want to, 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 to have on the one hand, and all the type of material you put in it in order to, in fact, create the mentality which will pull people Upward. When you look at uh, the DRC, but also at most African countries, you will see that mostly it is a replica of what is done outside. We tend to repeat. We tend not to create, to innovate, to solve our problems locally. Because that is what a system should do. Help you to solve your problems locally, not simply to imitate what is done elsewhere and which corresponds to other realities and other wishes. So I think that we need a system where people are trained to actually be able to solve their daily problems, both theoretically and practically. And uh, it means that we join in the digital revolution. Uh, when I see that most of our, of our programs, like it, for instance in, 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 in DRC, talk about hydraulic power. Hydraulic power still is, I think INGA 3 now, used to be 2, but INGA 3. It's about hydraulic power. To me, it is really a, a mystery. There is a sun shining on every African village, if I'm not mistaken. Why not? use that technology to give people 
electricity. And everywhere you have uh, wind power, which can be used, you have alternative means of energy that can be used everywhere. And especially a country like, uh, like uh, DRC is replete of such, such, such places and such areas. So why always cling to the old way of doing things? And I think that we can have a jump start by actually going into the digital revolution. We will not be able to train one million, two million engineers a year if we go through the normal school system. It's not possible. What we need today is to reach the same goals by going through the digital revolution. And I think that is the way we should approach things today. And if we do that with sincerity, I'm sure we can, we can uh, reach our goals. Now concerning uh, democracy. It is a very deep and I think a very uh, important topic, especially in Africa. We must have the courage to draw the balance sheet of what we call democracy in an African context today. Has it caused more deaths or has it brought more political liberations and enthusiasm and good? I think it's a very important issue. When you look at what we call democracy, for most African political social scientists, most African political actors, including in the DRC, for them, it is a translation of what obtains here into their context. In other words, you must have an opposition on one hand, you must have a government on the other, and maybe the civil society or the NGOs. The question which needs to be answered today, does that approach and that configuration work? It is fundamental. If you take the DRC for the last 20 or 25 years, around 10 million people have died. It's huge. It is unacceptable. That's only for one country. But if we add up all what I call the victim of a very outdated type of democratic uh, concept, Africa is not the winner in this game, in my view. So we need to rethink what we mean by democracy. We cannot continue to behave as if Africa is a land which has never in its culture have democracy. It's not true. The type of democracy we have is called consensual democracy. And that is why at the end of the day, you will end up with what is called government of national union. The last example being precisely in DRC, where the former opposition is getting together with the former uh, government, and now they're seeing things together. The philosophy of democracy in Africa is not adversarial. It's not the type where, on the one hand, you have the, the government, and on the other, you have the opposition. The question which I always ask to anyone who listens to me, especially if they are from Africa, is to tell me in, in, in which village in Africa you can show me the head of the opposition. And in which village you will, she, you will show me the head of the, the, the government, the ruling uh, coalition. It doesn't exist. Does not mean that there's no opposition in Africa. Yes, there is. But the modality to have the rules changed, to have your views taken into consideration, are specific to our culture. And I would beg uh, to, 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 to submit that it is about time we go back to the drawing board, look at the consensual ways which are the order of a day, and look at the different actors who must be in the political game, and 
just to have a PhD today or a master's is not enough in order to be on target to solve problems of the population. I think that we need a blend of our own culture and the blend with cultures from outside of Africa and engineer something which can last and can work. We cannot continue to go in our villages, talk about uh, the treaties, and I say the Vladivostok Treaty or the, I don't know, the, the Vienna Treaty, or to people who, in fact, do not understand what you are talking about. And one of the reasons, in my view, why uh, problems are recurrent is because they're not addressed from the root. They are addressed superficially. And we think that by giving a, a, a few dollars, we have solved the problem. In fact, we have not. And the very idea of democracy being universal, I think, should be contested. The idea that there's only one way of doing things in parliament, in government, with the opposition on one hand, with the, with the government on the other, I think has proven to be rather dangerous. Today, we need to sit down and manufacture an approach which will make sense to the ordinary African. So I think that's, to me, it's important. It's one of the lessons which I would like to see apply in the beginning of this uh, new era in uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo. I will end my talk by saying that, in fact, when we look at Africa today, the only problem which I see is that most Africans do not know much about themselves. They don't know much about themselves and therefore about the possibilities that are, that are open to them. We tend to be uh, thinking that the solutions to African problems will come from without Africa. But I think it's not possible. I think it is high time that we tell African that while not uh, denying what the international community could bring eventually, the, the thrust of the development process must rest with us. And the other efforts are only additional, not central to what we are doing and to what we do. And I think that message should be made clear. Because otherwise, you have 500 million youth in Africa today. 500 million who are less than 20 years of age. They will determine whether Africa, there will be a blessing or a curse for Africa. And I think the stakes of today are really with those youths. How well trained they are. How equipped they become to solve the problems of their environment, of their context, of their philosophy, of their values. And I think that if we continue to play that game, which is dangerous, to think that solutions will be brought from abroad, I don't know why and by whom, I think that we are preparing disaster on the continent. So we need, therefore, to review those things in good fraternity with the rest of the world, of course, but the driving seat of the developmental process should be owned and should be uh, piloted by the Africans in general, but by the African youth in particular, which, is, which has a lot of genius, a lot of inventivity, a lot of innovation, but unfortunately is not given enough ear to do what they want and to produce a winning African combination. Thank you very much indeed for your kind attention. Thank you. Okay, I, uh, I don't know whether you have some questions or maybe contributions because uh, when I teach here, I always uh, insist on saying that um, the learning process is interactive. I don't believe that there's one person who can sit ex cathedra and then give the word and then the others just take and then go. I think that interaction is very important and the experiences of each of those who are here, be they linked to Africa 
be the link to another part of the world. I think uh, when we mean what we mean by a global village is that. But the problem that I always have that notion of global village is which district of a global village you want to inhabit. That is really the problem with that. Uh, a village has many quarters. A city has many districts. Uh, it's not the same thing uh, if you live in one or the other. So we must fight to, so that all the districts of the village have a decent lifestyle and a decent and human uh, capacity building to, to, to be able to, for people to live uh, uh, in a, I think, in a very honorable manner. Okay, so if you have questions or you have uh, comments or you have uh, observations, please feel free to make them and to, to share with us. Yes, uh, Professor Rothbard. About the international context. What kind of pressures? And is there any great power competition over influence? Like, perhaps European Union. I have a second. When young people get educated, especially get educated in the West, do they come back? And they Well, uh, the first one is uh, the geopolitical aspect of, of the conflict in, in, in DRC. Yes, I think for the first time we saw a, the implication of many, many, many countries. Uh, what used to be the case was, of course, the East-West confrontation by what we call, as you know, the proxy wars. That is to say the wars which are fought not by the people directly, but uh, in the name of uh, some superpowers. And I think that, uh, the, the, of course, you had that in, in, in the first instance. And even a regime like that of, of President Mobutu was more or less aligned to, to the West and to, to the US. And uh, Mr. Mr. Lumumba was uh, uh, accused of uh, being uh, um, aligned with the East, though there is absolutely no proof whatsoever to, to actually uh, to, to credit that, that view. There's no view. He himself has always said no. He's an African nationalist. He's not uh, working for somebody or some superpower. So in the 60s and 70s and part of the 80s, it was clear. But the new uh, development is in Africa itself, where we have countries that have been involved in the DRC conflicts, such as Rwanda, such as uh, indirectly, indirectly uh, Uganda, such as South Africa even, uh, such as, uh, um, uh, no, there, there have been a few countries like that that have come, and the United Nations, uh, sorry, the African, African Union also has sent in uh, troops there. So that is, I think, the new development. Uh, there were eight such, such countries in Africa that were involved in uh, the, uh, the problems of the DRC. Were they able to solve them? I don't think so. I don't think so. And many were even accused of uh, making sure that the conflict continues because, is it true or not, they were gaining benefit from their interaction uh, in terms of uh, smuggling some of the, the mines, with, uh, the, the minerals which uh, were abundant there. Now I'm saying that it, this needs to be proven, but these were allegations that were made. So I would say between East and West, yes, in the beginning, but then after that you had even within the African continent itself, you had many, many uh, countries that were uh, involved in, in that, uh, in that uh, particular fight. And uh, I would say that war. Now, the young, I think, uh, you see when you are in an in a, in educational system that shows you that the grass is greener uh, beyond the Mediterranean uh, and so on, I think that uh, often you, you, you end up with people who go and uh, they don't uh, feel like coming back. But my question is, is very simple, is that uh, it's not the Martians who will come and, 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 and do things, it, it's us. Now, there are people who cannot come back because they have, of course, threats on their lives. Uh, they are in danger. Uh, and then if they come back, probably they will, uh, 
they will suffer maybe brutalities and so on. That that is clear, no problem. But I'm saying that there are many who can come back and uh, try to build up something. Uh, you have many types of youth. You cannot categorize them as as one category. I think there are those who go in order to acquire a knowledge. But in my view, such knowledge cannot be used uh, like that. It has to be contextualized. Because I, I think that each culture, each uh, part of the world has its own realities. And I think for uh, a knowledge to be used in, a, in, in the best way possible, it is important to contextualize it. So you'll have more benefit from it. So not just apply it uh, half as easily without uh, changing anything. Sometimes it may lead even to the reverse of what you are looking for. Yes, sir. Well, thank you, Professor. Have you worked in the year of civil laws of the day? Difficult to mention. It also not limited to your sales for the At the same time, I, I, every time I'm engaging in discussions with European ambassadors or Western ambassadors, I um, it's been overconfident on their parliamentary I was really curious to hear what, what's your what's reactions are you getting here in Vienna when you're you know, Okay. Well, um, I must say that I don't, I'm not talking to the United Nations uh, uh, officials in Vienna. <laughs> so maybe the type of reaction I have is uh, basically an academic style. Uh, and I think the students here are, are open to, to, to all kinds of analysis, uh, which is the trademark, of course, of an international school. Um, this kind of discourse is not, it's not always very well accepted, uh, to be honest. Because uh, behind, behind democracy or democratization, there's often an agenda, a hidden agenda. Uh, when you're democratizing it, on our camp, uh, it's better than to democratize, democratize on the other camp, camp uh, in front. So um, you see, for instance, uh, the demise of Muammar Gaddafi, for instance. Okay. Everyone said, OK, he's a, he's a horrible person. He's a, is the devil incarnate and so on. My view is very different. It is true that in his relationships with America and with Europe, it was awful. He did terrible things, ordering the bombing of two B-47s, I think. Uh, sorry, not B, uh, Bo yeah, Boeing 747s. It's awful. No one in his right mind can support such a such a decision is is even it's, it's terrible. It's true. But now you take his relations with Africa. It's a different ball game. He contributed. He 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 had joint ventures. He gave a lot of his time and money. Now the problem is to ask us to condemn him, not on the ground of our relation, but on the ground of a dis despicable relations which they had. I think that is where the problem is. I'm saying that we cannot do that. Just as the reverse would have also been not, not acceptable. Every continent has to defend its best interest. It's normal. Now, it's one thing to say, that man was not a saint, for sure. But we cannot say, we must condemn him despite what he did for us. So that is why international relations, from an ethical standpoint, is very problematic. Very problematic. So democracy, to me, should be the uplifting of populations towards the realization of their common well-being. And it's just a tool. The important thing is to reach that goal. Now there is no set way. It's just like a mountain. If you go from here, you could reach there. If you go from here, you will reach there. But the idea that there is one uh, universal, universal uh, path is one that is, to me, problematic. It's problematic because of the 
uh, consequences we've seen throughout the world. Okay? And now there are specific things which, for an African, are shocking. You take the, um, you take the this mass, this, uh, this, uh, massive, the, the, the arms of this disruption, the dis massive destruction what is it, unit in, in, uh, in Iraq. When pre uh, General, uh, um, the American General Colin Powell came to, to the United Nations Security Council, the mass, is it mass destruction? Uh, weapons of mass destruction, exactly. It was a pathetic episode. Pathetic. Because precisely, it rested on hypotheses which were false. So why all this in front of 193 countries saying that they had those weapons? They were certain that they had them. They will attack that country to destroy them. There was nothing. What lessons were drawn from that? What apologies did we receive from this pitiful theater? Nothing. So it leaves marks, to be very honest, on the sincerity and the credibility of an organization which is supposed to represent the entire world. There's a problem. There's a problem. There's only one, but there are many more like that. So I think that we need to be honest. We need to address the problems. The idea that one camp has all the answers and the others only has to take them uh, lying down is not correct. I think that all of us can bring our own ideas, our own values, in order to make the world a better place because it's in our interest. Okay. Yes, sir. Um, <laughs> yes, of course. Mm -hmm. True, true. Even injunctions were given. Injunctions were given, which were not, uh, I think, thankfully. Yes. Yeah. Uh, you, you, uh, even, yes, go ahead. You, you haven't finished. The second one about the, the own democracy to manufacture the own democracy. We think in Africa today, three years away and four years. The government, local government, are left the position. Two questions. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Yes, it's true that, uh, especially concerning DRC, starting with uh, the Congo Leopoldville and then, and then uh, Zaire and then today DRC, uh, there's been also there's been a lot of competition. If you take even France and and and, and Belgium, it's clear that uh, under Valéry Giscard d'Estaing. That's when the move was made towards, uh, towards uh, the, the Zaire at the time. When he came in, I think it was 670, was it 74, I think, when we, or 73, where he made a very clear move towards uh, uh, cooperation, increased cooperation with... Uh, and in fact, the Belgian, Belgium was thinking that it was not appropriate to, to do that because of historical reasons. But, I think that that's when you started to see already a, a cleavage between, between Western countries. But it was clear at the last elections, of course. Um, when you take even the Americans, you take the Europeans, and within the Euro Europe also you have different shades of, 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 of positions. But I think 
um, especially the leadership we have today in, in America. Uh, one wonders really, one has many questions about what, what that leadership can bring. But what is certain is that the DRC has the type of products no one can do without, I think. And I think the positioning, which is ideological, is not so ideological. I think it is economic. It is economic. And what we see today, to me, is superficial because there is an understanding that control should always remain in the Western camp, I think. Of, about that, there is no real uh, squabbling. Now, the, the, the question is, if the DRC authorities, public um, figures, and so on, start to create a coalition, because after all, all these minerals, they are your anc ancestral uh, patrimony. It is your ancestral pandemic. But when you see the way people behave, it is as if they're just guarding them and they don't belong to them. That's the impression that is given. So I think that there's a lot of mind reconstruction to make before people start assessing the role that should be theirs. Start behaving in a way that will draw the benefits but then redistribute them to a majority of people. Because studies have shown that there's enough wealth in Africa for everybody. If you look at the amounts of money which are sent abroad, it's, it's phenomenal. But what the law says, international law and criminal law says, the one who brings the looted funds or looted goods is equally um, guilty as the one who takes it. You who keep it in your bank, you who keep it in your country, when the sentence, the legal sentence falls, you will have exactly the same sanction. So that's why when we hear about corruption, corruption is very bad. No one should, and I think it's one of the main problems which we have. But it's like tango, you need two to tango. If the money is taken by a civil servant who earns next to nothing, but brings in three, four million dollars, you don't need to be a, a police commissioner to know that that money cannot come from his savings. But when you take it, you become an accomplice. In the eyes of a law, you're equally, it's called coaction in crime. That's what it is. So I think it's important to tell our friends from the West and from other places that any time that looted property or looted money is taken, you become an accomplice of those who brought it to you. And then perhaps the terms of the discussion will change. Um, you talked about uh, building democracy. Okay, I, I want just to maybe to illustrate that with uh, an example of uh, someone who did something. I have two examples. To me, we not we should not be talking about things that could happen somewhere in the stratosphere. They have already happened in Africa. I will give you an example which might, which, which might surprise you. It's the example of a man called William de Klerk. William de Klerk was president of South Africa. Granted, the terms of his presidency and the modality were not exactly uh, unanimous, to say the least. But he was the one who had under his command the police, the judiciary, the magistracy, uh, the, 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 the army. He was the commander-in-chief of South Africa. At the time, 
William the Clerk, had he risen like what we see around us in Africa, would have clung to power. What he did was he realized that if true democracy descends on South Africa, it means that the majority population will become those who will be at the driver's seat. So what he did was something that has never been done nowhere in the world. It's very important because it happened in Africa. He negotiated a process at the end of which he becomes vice president, not first, second vice president, and a prisoner named Nelson Rolisasa Mandela, who had moral prestige and consideration, but who was a prisoner in terms of his condition. He was a prisoner. The other one had all the powers, and he had none, practically. He negotiated, I said, a program, a, a process, at the end of which he turned out to become the second vice president and the prisoner in the name of democracy, in the name, in the name of majority rule, would be his boss, that is to say, the head of state. I suggest that to me, that is what I call a, states, a statesman. That is somebody who puts not his own life forward, but he says that for the sake of my country, if it commands that I do this, I will do it. And he did it. Today we may think that it is a, it is a small, no, it's not a small feat. It's a big thing which he did. That's one example. The second, of course, is Nelson Mandela himself. Why has Nelson Mandela succeeded as a president? That gentleman, between the age of 10 and 14, every day, attended the Kosa traditional court, which was presided over by his uncle, who was the king. He's, he writes all that. So he says that everything which I have applied in my life in terms of politics was drawn from my Kosa cultural background. It's very important because people want to reinvent the wheel. No. And what are the premises, what are the, the core values of his political education? Because it's important we know that. One, the ability to listen. Listen. Not just uh, uh, sit there, to listen. Second, the necessity to have everyone on board before you, you move to the next stage. There's no such thing as majority or minority, no. Consensual approach is the name of a game. Everyone, as much as possible, as far as possible, must be on the boat. That is the way we do our things. And that's the reason why he was able to take all the time. Four times he was asked to get out of jail. Four times he said, no. I will get there, if ever, on my own terms. And this is what he did. Because he believed in a few core values. What are our core values of our politicians whom we know? For which they are prepared to die. What are they? I wish to know. I'm sure there are some who have, but they are not the majority. So I'm saying that uh, when you are in our villages, as you know, even if I'm sure you're here, you've been here maybe for long, I don't know, but in our villages, what makes a chief a chief? He never lies. Even if it is detrimental to his own personal uh, uh, interest, he doesn't lie. A chief does not, does not steal. No. If you do those two things, you, you're no longer worthy of becoming a public figure. In our societies, traditional ones, these were the values which you found. But today, can we say that we are replicating that? Everyone can answer. All right. Yes, sir. Professor, you Wonder. 
What is very interesting is that I was, as I said, a young fellow in, uh, in Zaire. When Rwanda, to be honest, was not considered a big, uh, a big shot, to say the least, in the Great Lakes uh, Commission, uh, Rwanda, like Burundi, the, was who was calling the, the one who was calling the shot was, of course, uh, from, from Kinshasa. Today, we have an inversion <laughs> of the reality because uh, it seems more true to say that uh, the place of Rwanda is uh, anything but marginal, <laughs> to say the least. How, was it, how is it possible? That's the question. Uh, and and how, how was that transition and that inversion possible? I think it's a big lesson. I know that there are many people from, from the DRC who don't like to, to, to talk about uh, Rwanda, or the, but I think this, this is, a, to me, it's not a scientific approach. It's, it's not a scientific approach. It's an epidemic. It's an epidemic approach. We don't need that. We need to, to look at things and see what are the factors that today explain the reversal of roles. Because today, Rwandan, Rwandan position uh, has value. Has value. Simply because order has been put back to the country. And I don't know how many of you have been to Rwanda. It's, it's, it's an unbelievable place. The place, first of all, is very clean, which is, frankly, uh, quite exceptional. People are disciplined. No, better. They are self-disciplined. When you go somewhere, don't try to jump the queue. You yourself cannot do that, because you see that it is not possible to do that. And if you throw a, 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 a paper on the grass, everyone will look at you, asking where this fellow comes from. That is how they have been able to, to reach a certain level of self-discipline. I believe personally more in self-discipline than in authoritarian discipline coming from somewhere else. But I think from a bad thing, which of course the, the, the genocide has been. Today when you go to Rwanda, you see that they have capitalized on that in a positive manner. It's not a country where there are no problems. Of course there are problems. Show me a country on earth where there's no problem. But the, the quality of life, even of security today, and so all that has, has changed. And the educational system is among the best in Africa which I think validates the hypothesis which I started to present here. They went through, they, they reshaped a few things, and they have an idea of a kind of citizen that, ma that must be produced by the type of school system they have. And this is what they are seeing today as fruits of their work. So to me, uh, it, is a, it is a small country, uh, but I think Austria, too, is a small country. But it's a very rich country. Uh, Switzerland also is a small country. But these are also well-to-do countries. So I think that the size is no longer uh, uh, a criteria to do well and to succeed. And I think that they are showing the way of the future of what Africa can do. I mean, I'm telling you, when you get to, 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 to Kigali, it's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. Everything works. From the civil service to the, to the, the motorbikes. And they have, uh, not the gilet jaune, but the gilet jaune is something else. But they have the, these uh, vests, and they have, the, they have the helmet. One for them, one for the passenger. If you try to do that in certain countries, it's riot. You'll get into terrible... Uh, problems because people are resisting that. So I'm saying that there's also a lot of pedagogy. Uh, the head of a country moves everywhere. And it, this is reminiscent of what, because I wrote a book on, on Thomas Sankara. Thomas Sankara did not sleep one night somewhere. He was always checking whether things are going the right way and so on. And his wife, whom uh, accepted to, to write the, the, the foreword of my book, 
tells me that even eating, he didn't eat. He was not interested in that. And he had one word, which I think is very interesting. I prefer to have water for all rather than champagne for a few. Drinkable water for all rather than champagne for a few. I think that's, that illustrates the kind of, of mindset. And I think it's possible in Africa. So my answer is, it is a model on which we can reflect, especially when you t we take history. We take 30 years ago or 40 years ago, we see what Rwanda was and was, what it meant, and today what it is and what it, meant, it means. But I'm saying that we must not also have a, an epid epidemic approach to this, because I know I'm aware of the fact that many people from DRC don't even want to discuss that. They say this and that. I don't, I don't think that that is a proper way of uh, approaching that subject. OK. <laughs> sure. <laughs> sure, dear colleague. <laughs> what, in your opinion, the most negative legacy Okay. This is a very, I would say, deep, deep question, which can hold us here for maybe the next one hour, to, if we want really to go. First of all, I, I'm maybe I, I'm not exactly in agreement with many African um, academics, perhaps, or, or I think that Africa was not the only continent to be colonized, was not the only people to be enslaved. Does not mean that it is a good thing. Does not mean that the consequences were not traumatic. They were. Yeah, because we thought that after a generation, things will return to normal. Because in, in our type of slavery, that's, I have many people in my villages who came in, and but today are in the, in the governing circles of a village. But they were not from there. Um, they, were, they came to work in the, in the camps and so on. So it's true. But what I'm saying is that it's a mindset. It's a mindset. We as Africans must understand that be it what we call what what do we call development what do we call development development to me when you conduct a survey in because in in, in my uh, institute we always have africans from all all parts of the continent so as I, I, we wrote a book called rethinking development from an african perspective and the first chapter of a book was the different definitions of development throughout Africa. What transpires from that is very interesting. Not a single definition given by those students from Ethiopia to, 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 to Zaire at the time, to, 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 to DRC today, uh, to Senegal, uh, to South Africa, not a single definition relates to a list of things which you must have before you are considered developed. Yes, that's, that's, I'm, I'm trying, I'm trying to, to, to bring. What they were saying is the definition of development is the ability of a community to master its own conditions and life. It's also the ability of each individual within the community to live a decent and acceptable life through solidarity. That is a definition which transpires when you do a, a synthesis. It's very interesting. So it means that it is linked to one, the notion of community. It is community derived. It's not individual. Two, it has a link of people to get a common goal and a common being together through interaction and solidarity. What is the definition which we have? The macroeconomic definition. 
the number of, uh, of tarred roads, the number of hospitals, the number of television and, and radio, and, and uh, so it is quantitative. So on the one hand, you have a qualitative definition. Because you, they went even too far as to say that milk, in pastoral societies, they said everyone must have milk, butter, yogurt, and so on. That is for them a developed society. Very interesting. On the one hand, on the other hand, you have a quantitative approach. GDP per capita, uh, uh, human development index, and so on and so forth. The problem with that is that when you take the World Bank, the World Bank uh, approach, they say is very poor, he who lives on one dollar a day, and is considered poor, he or she, of course, who lives on two dollars a day. That's a poor, very poor, one dollar. The problem is that in most rural areas, people have not one dollar, nothing. They stay on months on end, just doing butter. I have chicken, you have plantains, or you have uh, cassava, okay, we exchange. You have rice, I have uh, um, beans, which that's the way many people live in Africa. They have no access to money. So how do you count them in World Bank statistics? Are they zombies? Are they what? So I think we must be very careful because if you use this kind of methodology, you apply it to the wrong society with the wrong, I mean, not, not with the wrong society with different ways of lives and values, you will end up with statistics which are flawed. So I, I did this long development to say that we use the same term. We may not talk about the same thing, which is problematic. That's why I, pr I prefer to talk about progress, change towards the better. That's what I see as being more consensual. Now, we cannot re reinvent the world. We cannot say, well, when I came here, I was in, 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 an, in an airplane. I was not uh, uh, driving, I was not on, on a horseback. So there are things which, of course, we, we can combine. But I think that the spirit of a society, the, this, the, the values, we should not put them aside. We should reinforce them, uh, like uh, medicine, things like that. 70% of people who are sick in African countries go to the traditional medical doctor. What does that mean for public medicine, public health? You cannot achieve public health by only building hospitals. The majority of people will not go there. In my country, in Cameroon today, we have a dual judicial system. We have the traditional system and we have the modern, known as that, system. In a city called Fumban, which is the headquarters of a department, of a department, seventy-five percent of people who are seeking justice go to the Sultan, who is who delivers traditional justice, and do not go to the judge the prosecutor and the magistrate and so on. What does that mean? It means that the type of verdict which is delivered, they understand. The other one which calls article this, uh, paragraph that, and that, they don't understand that. It's not so much something they, they, are, they are keen to, to go to. So it means that, we, can we reach development by sidelining those very important aspects which are really addressing the core of who we are? That's my question. And I think that we cannot. And I think that we need to take that into consideration. If we do that, we, we blend the two systems, we, we take elements which reinforce each other in the, the direction of finding the best solution for the individual in the context where he is, then we'll reach, I think, development in, in terms of progress. That's what I would say. OK. Yes. Um, uh, maybe. maybe, maybe uh one, one more question. Um, so I, I think the, the political 
uh, process of the past few years in the DRC has shown um, that, that there is actually a, a vivid democratic tradition in the DRC. You see that mm -hmm. uh, Kabila uh, did not manage to uh, send the presidential term. Very true. President Kagame, they did manage. Um, you see that they are using terms where, where um, you have uh, uh, Mr. Fayou as the president élu and, and President Tshisekedi as the president négocié. Mm -hmm. So, so with the Radio Tutuwa, etc., there is a, there, there is a vivid uh, tradition, but ne nevertheless, there are also quite a lot of, of uh, problems, I think, to, to get a step further in the democratization process, whichever form, form it, will, it will take mm -hmm. uh, in the east of Congo. Uh, in, in other uh, parts, there, there are still um, um, armed struggles, uh, able crisis <coughs> today, but, but let's hope that will, that will be managed in the near future. Um, and the, the, the lack of data even, um, so even if you want to form the education uh, in the whole country, it, it will be very, very difficult. To so, what would, uh, in your opinion, what would be the, the, let's say, the very, very first step to strengthen the democratization process? Well, I don't think that one has a, the magical uh, stick to, to change that. But I think you said many things concerning, for instance, the arms uh, uh, situation and so on. You see, frankly, I think uh, when you take uh, arms, um, the arms industry, you have only two countries that manufacture arms. Uh, you have South Africa and you have in, uh, Egypt uh, at an industrial level. So um, most of the arms which are there are not coming from, from these two countries. They come from all over the world. And the democratization system in, in after, after the fall of the Berlin Wall in November 1989, uh, also materialized in, in the democratization of, of acquisition of arms, I'm afraid. Uh, with $14 or $15, you could acquire arms. And we created those things called, uh, this, this category of people called uh, 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 children, is it soldiers? Uh, uh, child soldiers. You cannot have a child soldier. Does it, doesn't mean, it doesn't mean anything. Because a child cannot be a soldier, and a soldier is someone who is trained. And by definition, cannot be a, ch a child. So I think these are things we have accepted very quickly. Now, concerning democracy, I think it's not easy. If I'm sitting here today, I'm saying that uh, it can be done tomorrow, it's, it's, it's an illusion. No. First of all, it, it's, it's consensual. My, my view of democracy is consensus. The idea that a group of people have a solution to other people's problems is, to me, not true. The people who are concerned are the ones who actually have the solution to the problems. Why don't we ask them? Yes, if you go to, 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 to the peasant class, peasant society, they've been doing that for ages. They, they know what, what is workable, what is not. Maybe we can bring uh, additional things, maybe. But the core, they know. But today we have a very interesting thing which is called uh, sustainable development. But my question is, can we really bring lessons of sustainable development in Africa and remain serious? I doubt it. Because the whole way of life of the African peasant is based on respect of nature for nature. He prefers to die rather than to destroy nature for his children. So I think when all these things are good, but I don't have a magic uh, solution. But I think that we must, those who are paid to think, like us, we must exhibit more humility. We must exhibit more humility because we call people who speak neither French, in English, German, or uh, Japanese, I'm sorry, or, 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 or uh, Spanish and so on, we call them illiterate. No, they're not illiterate. They don't speak European languages, but they're not illiterate. You have wise people in their culture who are 
full of experience and knowledge. The fact that they don't speak one of the European language or northern uh, hemisphere language cannot categorize them as illiterate, no. So, but these are things that we do in Africa ourselves, with our own people. We say, okay, when you go to a village, oh, you know these people, they're, no, they're illiterate, no. So the statistics which we, which we put there, rate of illiteracy is wrong. It means simply the rate of people who don't speak the official language adopted by the country. That's what it means. But it doesn't mean that they are literate. So you see, if we pay attention to these things, we may change the way we perceive ourselves. Because we need to pay respect to a whole category of people who can have the key to our solutions. But we throw them away and we say, since they have not gone to school like us, since they don't hold PhDs or master's degree or whatever, therefore they are uneducated. No, certainly not. They are educated in their own culture and civilization. And they can teach you, me, tons of things which we don't know. So I think that humility of those who, of us who are paid to think is a good starting point. And I think I can only talk of that because that's what I know uh, rather than maybe to ask for the politicians to change. I don't know that political world so well, but I know that if we have a different approach to, to knowledge, different respect for what is called ancestral traditional knowledge, maybe we can reach quicker our goals than before. Thank you very much. Okay, so I think we're already at 8, <laughs> eight o'clock. Since it's been streamlined, I think that the will probably soon stop. So I would like to thank you very much for your time, your patience, and especially your comments and your observations. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.